Today, Alina will be giving a talk called International Development in the Information Age. It starts from observing the exponential increase in computing power and data sets over the last decade, which brings with it the capacity to trans transform industries from manufacturing um, to development. This is a talk on <coughs> leveraging geospatial data to enable decision makers around the world to more effectively use foreign aid dollars in the fight against global poverty. Alina, who is an expert in the field, will offer insights on how organizations can better confront the challenges to truly bring the international development efforts fully into the information age. So please join me in welcoming Alina Stern. Good morning, can everyone hear me all right? Excellent. Um, so while Jacob gets my presentation uh, loaded, I just want to thank everyone for making it out here early in the morning on a Sunday. It's great to be at a conference where you can pack a room on a Sunday morning to talk about data, so you know I'm with the right people. Um, perfect. And so Max did an excellent job sort of setting the stage of the immense amount of progress that international development has made. Um, and I'm going to talk about the future of international development, or at least what I hope the future is going, of taking a more data and science driven approach to international development. Uh, so first, to start with a bit of context. Um, last year, as many of you know, the development community ratified the Sustainable Development Goals, which is a set of ambitious objectives for what the world can achieve by 2030. This includes eradicating extreme poverty, ending all forms of malnutrition, universal secondary education, and access to safe drinking water for all people. The Economist has estimated that to achieve the SDGs will require two to three trillion dollars per year over 15 years. Because while these goals are ambitious, they represent just four of the 169 targets that are part of the Sustainable Development Goals. Now I'm not here today to talk about whether the SDGs set forth the right goals or targets. But it seems pretty clear to me that if we have any shot of achieving the SDGs by 2030 or of ending extreme poverty in our lifetimes, the international development community needs to use every dollar of foreign aid as effectively as possible. This means precisely targeting resources to reach the people that need them most, coordinating efforts across actors to avoid duplication, and evaluating programs to learn from our experience and avoid repeating our past mistakes. And to do any of this requires information, and lots of it. The good news is we're living in the information age. We have access to more data than ever before, and the supply of digital information is growing rapidly. And this big data could provide big value to the global economy. The McKinsey Global Institute estimates that open data could provide added value of $3 trillion per year in just seven sectors of the global economy. And this added value alone would be enough to fully fund the SDGs according to the economists' estimates. The bad news is that the dividends of the data revolution have not been evenly shared. And low and middle income countries are still plagued by poor quality and missing data, which philanthropist Mo Ibrahim termed the seminal crisis at the heart of global decision making, the crisis of poor data. And Ibrahim concludes that we'll never end extreme poverty if we don't know who or where the poor are or how much is being spent to help them. And I agree with Ibrahim. I think the international development community needs to leverage this growing supply of open data if we have any chance of winning the fight against global poverty. And in my talk today, I'm going to share a few promising data-driven innovations that my organization, Aid Data, and some of our partners are working on to help bring international development into the information age. So first, we need to end the crisis of bad data in low and middle income countries. And one dimension of this crisis is a lack of precise information on how and where development aid money is being spent. Aid data is working to address this challenge by identifying and tracking the sub-national locations of aid programs on a global scale. Now this sub-national precision is really important to make sure that no one is left behind by global development efforts. This is one of the first maps that Aid Data produced using our geocoded data, which showed that World Bank and African Development Bank projects were clustered in the south of Kenya, leaving the incredibly poor areas in the north of Kenya relatively underfunded. 
So this prompted the World Bank and the African Development Bank to see their distribution clearly on a map and reevaluate whether they were leaving poor populations in the north of Kenya behind. To date, aid data has geocoded 128,000 different development aid projects, representing $724 billion of development finance tracked. And working with partners like the USAID Global Development Lab and the US Department of Defense Minerva Initiative, we're on track to geocode the universe of aid in 17 countries around that world and release that data to the public for free. So this represents a critical step forward in the transparency and the precision of information on how foreign aid money is being spent around the world. But of course, the global development landscape is changing rapidly, and emerging donors like China and the Gulf Coast cooperation states represent an increasing share of development assistance provided around the world. However, these emerging donors do not exactly report their data publicly on what aid projects are funding around the world. And this creates a critical blind spot in the picture of development investment globally. So aid data has pioneered a methodology to fill in this blind spot. We use publicly available media resources and a rigorous methodology to triangulate those media reports against each other to uncover development projects funded by emerging donors. To date, we've been able to identify over 5,500 projects funded by China, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Kuwait. And this information is especially critical for decision makers in countries like Angola, where Chinese development finance represents more than half of all external development funding received since 2000. Aid data is also working to fill in the total resource envelope of development assistance by tracking domestic public expenditure and foreign direct investment. So we're beginning to fill in the picture of development investments around the world. But this only tells part of the story, of course. To really understand the development investment, precise data on development inputs needs to be met by equally precise data on development outputs to be able to evaluate whether these investments are yielding impacts. However, measuring data on development progress is often easier said than done. Despite significant progress over the last 30 years, critical data gaps on development progress still remain. So a couple examples. We only have actual data on maternal mortality for 15% of all births, and on malaria for only 16% of all deaths. And for six countries in Africa, there's practically no maternal mortality or malaria data at all. India, which has the highest number of malnourished people in the world, has not produced nationally representative malnutrition data in over a decade. And 21 countries in Africa have not collected national survey data in more than seven years. So the good news is that the international development community is paying more attention to the crisis of bad data than ever. The ratification of the SDGs has prompted calls for a data revolution, increasing investment in the provision of data to fill in these data gaps and enable monitoring of progress to meet the SDGs. However, like most revolutions, the data revolution promises to be expensive. Open Data Watch estimates that to collect this data to measure the SDGs would require 300 to 400 million dollars per year of development investment in data collection. And that's more than double current expenditures on data globally. So where are we going to find the money to fill in these data gaps? We'll either have to reallocate development investments away from other pressing priorities, or we're going to have to get creative. A group of researchers at Stanford University are trying to do just that. They received a grant from Aid Data in 2014 to assess whether they could use satellite imagery to collect highly accurate measurements on global poverty. The researchers designed a neural network, which is a machine learning algorithm that learns from data, to extract accurate subnational poverty estimates from high resolution satellite imagery. The researchers used nighttime lights data to map the spatial distribution of poverty, because areas that are darker at night are highly correlated with lower economic outcomes. They then used this data, along with survey data and high-resolution daytime imagery data, to identify features in the daytime imagery that are correlated with poverty. This is things like what material someone's roof is made out of, or the proximity of communities to road networks or urban centers. So using this transfer learning approach, they're able to devise a way to estimate poverty using satellite data that explains up to 75% of local economic development outcomes, which is a highly accurate estimation of subnational poverty around the world. And what's exciting is these researchers only used publicly available and frequently updated satellite imagery, which makes this methodology a potentially cost-effective and scalable solution to provide timely and accurate poverty data. 
And I think these sort of big data approaches to data collection are a really exciting potential solution to fill in the gaps of data collection. And I hope and aid data is encouraging sort of increased investment and attention in this space. Because I think to fill in the data gaps that exist using just the traditional data collection methods alone is likely way too expensive to be achievable or sustainable. So as we're improving the supply of data on development investments and outcomes, of course we need to ask ourselves the question, what are we going to do with all this data? And one area where sort of the growing supply of data has the potential to improve development practice is in how we target development projects to actually reach the poorest people around the world. So it seems very obvious that if development investments are meant to alleviate poverty, then aid projects that provide services to the poor should be located where poor people actually live. Unfortunately, development organizations are not always effective at doing this. Uh, Dr. Ryan Briggs at Virginia Technical University assessed whether World Bank and African Development Bank programs were effectively citing their projects to target poor people in the countries where they worked. He used aid data's geocoded data to assess whether locations of aid programs actually correlate with the distribution of poverty in, uh, in these countries. And he found that not only is the location of aid projects not correlated with poverty, but actually the distribution of aid money was significantly skewed towards rich populations. And in fact, the richest quartile of the population received more than three times the funding than their population share. So the good news is that incorporating geospatial data into these allocation decisions could help improve the ability of foreign aid investments to actually reach poor populations. A 2007 study in the Journal of Development Economics modeled the impact of using subnational data through geographic targeting to actually improve the targeting of development aid programs. So they looked at the economic development outcomes of, sort of a hypothetical development project in Cambodia. And they found that the same level of poverty alleviation that could be achieved by a uniform resource transfer to all members of the population could be achieved with just over half of that cost by targeting resources at the province level and less than a third of the total cost by allocating resources according to poverty at the commune level. And what this research shows is that by just changing the way we make decisions, by being more spatially aware and incorporating geospatial data into these processes, we can get vastly more development impact for our money. So fortunately, more development organizations are incorporating these sort of geospatial targeting methods into their work. Uh, one example of that is PEPFAR, uh, the president's project on emergency aid relief in the United States. Um, and PEPFAR's Nigeria team worked with aid data to assess whether they were allocating their resources in Nigeria to effectively reach poor populations. So we worked together and we analyzed subnational poverty, population density, and road networks data to assess what percentage of Nigeria's poor population lived within reasonable reach of a clinic that was supported by PEPFAR. And now PEPFAR can use this data to identify populations that they may be leaving behind in their investment strategy and target their future investments to maximize the reach of their programs and ultimately their development impact. Another area where the growth of geospatial data can improve development effectiveness is in efforts to evaluate the impact of development programs. So in these efforts, randomized control trials, RCTs, have long been regarded as the gold standard. Uh, this methodology was popularized for use in international development by the Poverty Action Lab, JPAL, and Innovations for Poverty Action, as has been discussed several times this weekend. Um, and despite the importance of impact evaluation methodologies, uh, this impact evaluation is critically underfunded. So as I'm sure many of you know, you know, RCTs work by randomly assigning the development intervention to a population and then comparing outcomes against a control group to be able to rigorously, causally identify the impact of development programs. And this is incredibly important to get rigorous evidence on what works and what doesn't in development. However, the Center for Global Development estimates that $50 million is spent annually on impact evaluation. And this is vastly inadequate when you consider that $130 billion is spent per year on official development assistance and trillions of dollars of domestic budget is spent on development programs annually. And many development agencies have found it difficult to increase funding for randomized impact evaluation. In some cases, it might be practically or ethically difficult to randomly assign a development activity to a population. And in other cases, perhaps the cost of an RCT can be prohibitive, uh, given sort of limited resources and competing development priorities. 
And so aid data as researchers have developed a new approach of impact evaluation that aims to address sort of both of these constraints to rigorous evaluation and development. We call it geospatial impact evaluation. So GIE brings together geospatial data on development inputs and spatial data on development outcomes, along with sort of increasingly available high-powered computing to fill what we like to call the missing middle of impact evaluation. So it's vastly more rigorous than performance monitoring, but is less time and cost intensive than RCTs. So GIE replicates the conditions of random assignment by analyzing terabytes of data on dozens of relevant variables to match each treatment location with a statistical twin. It's a location that's the same in all of the covariates, so the other relevant variables we're interested in, but it, the one difference is that the twin location didn't receive the development intervention in question. And so in this way, we can use this quasi-experimental method to sort of create the rigorous statistical control group that enables the rigorous identification of sort of causal program impact. Um, but a key distinction is that GIE uses, you know, existing data from satellites, surveys, and administrative data. So in this sense, a lot of times GIE can be conducted remotely, which is great in cases where it might be sort of difficult for safety reasons or accessibility reasons to collect data at project locations, and it avoids the sort of expensive uh, field data collection costs. Um, another thing that's exciting about GIEs is that because sort of satellite imagery especially has a long time series, many satellite imagery uh, sources have up to 30 years of time series, that GIE can actually enable evaluations that in sort of instances that weren't possible previously. Um, so a couple of examples of this. So GIE can actually be used to conduct a retrospective evaluation of a project that's already been finished, but where an impact evaluation was never conducted in the first place. So that enables us to create new evidence on programs that were never evaluated, but are critically important to understand whether they were impactful, because it uses these existing sources of data. Another exciting application is in assessing sort of the long-run impacts of development programs. So this is important for two reasons. One, we want to make sure whether a sort of short-term development impact that we observe is actually sustained over the long term. If a project's really successful in the short term, but then you know, poverty alleviation benefits drop off in the long term, we want to be able to know that so we can understand how to make our projects more successful and you know, promote economic development in the long term. And so because these data have a long time series, we can actually collect project data and measure impact at different points over time. This is also critical because different projects have different development impact trajectories, or we call sort of functional forms of development. So to take a couple of examples, you know, distributing antiretroviral therapy to prevent HIV AIDS prevalence and death rates from HIV, you'd expect to see that have impact pretty immediately. You get people on these courses of medicine and you expect to see infection rates drop and then death rates drop pretty quickly thereafter. So you'd be able to measure the impact of an ARV distribution project pretty soon after project completion. But other programs, like let's say supporting decentralization, so strengthening local governance to make governments more responsible to sort of the citizens in a country, you would actually expect to see outcomes get worse before they get better, because these newly formed municipal governments may not have the capacity immediately to be effective, and then they gain that capacity over time through governing. So if you were to evaluate a sort of decentralization project right after completion, you might erroneously conclude that all these projects aren't effective, because you actually need to collect that data in a sort of longer time period after the project is finished to really be able to measure impact. Um, so in a lot of cases, sort of collecting that long-run data when you have to actually go to project sites and collect data in the field might be prohibitive, but by using these existing sort of satellite data sources, it actually makes this type of uh, evaluation much more accessible. Another sort of unique application of GIE is because a lot of these satellite sources have near global coverage. GIE enables the evaluation of development programs or sort of impact across multiple countries. So one example of this is Aid Data recently partnered with the MacArthur Foundation to conduct the first of its kind evaluation of the impact that Chinese development finance has sort of a negative environmental impact around the world. So by using these sort of globally covered uh, satellite imagery sources, we're able to assess the impact of Chinese development investment around the world. Um, but we're, uh, and so there's some other examples of how we've used this data, um, which is the evaluation methodology. We're evaluating the impact of indigenous land demarcation in the Brazilian Amazon, of insecticide-treated bed net distribution in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and natural resource concessions on local economic development outcomes in Liberia. So this type of methodology is really applicable across sectors, um, you know, giving it a potential to really scale in terms of how we evaluate development activities. 
We're also working to sort of push impact evaluation one step further by not just asking if a project has a statistically significant impact, but whether the magnitude of that impact makes the project a good value for the money. So by mining existing data on cost-benefit analysis or outcome valuation, we're able to assess whether the impact observed for a specific project makes it a good buy relative to its peers to understand whether individual projects are underperforming or overperforming relative to expected outcomes. Uh, in addition, because we can often have subnational data on development outcomes, we can actually assess within project sites what specific locations are performing better or worse to understand heterogeneous impacts within a project. And one sort of exciting application of this is we're bringing together sort of propensity score matching and machine learning approaches to analyze sort of what variables are driving these differences in impact observed both across projects and within projects. And what we're finding is that oftentimes this machine learning approach can yield surprising results. Uh, so one example of this, Aid Data has recently partnered with the Global Environmental Facility within the World Bank to evaluate the impact of their programs on preventing land degradation around the world, preventing deforestation and you know, erosion, other forms of land degradation. And what we found was that the single variable that was most strongly correlated with observed impact was the proportion of a project's funds that come from co-financing from other donors. Now, what I'm excited about this finding, I know it might sound a little dry, is that the researchers didn't include this ratio in the design from the outset, because they just assumed it wouldn't be important. But the machine learning algorithm was actually able to identify that this variable that conventional wisdom would have overlooked was the single most important variable as sort of being correlated with development investments. And so that finding is prompting the Jeff to sort of reevaluate how they're structuring their development programs so they can sort of set those programs up for success. So I, we're sort of standing um, on the precipice of you know, the information revolution for international development. And I think this really has the potential to transform the way development is practiced. So these you know, gains that we've seen in data collection methodologies could sort of finally fill the data gaps that have long left the poorest populations around the world undercounted and underserved. And when you bring that together with sort of newly accessible, high-powered computing and innovative analysis methodologies, I think we can actually say that we have the power in our hands to make each development dollar go further than ever before. But of course, just because data exists does not necessarily mean that people will use it to make policy decisions. Aid data is conducting research to understand the conditions under which sort of development data will actually yield policy changes and impacts. We recently conducted a study in Timor-Leste, Senegal, and Honduras to understand the barriers that exist to incorporating data into development decisions made sort of at a country level. And we found that really significant barriers exist. So for a couple of examples, uh, in Timor-Leste, only 1% of the population has internet access, and 42% of adults are illiterate, rendering most data that's produced in Timor-Leste inaccessible or unusable. In Senegal, vitally important data from clinics and schools is still collected via pen and paper methodologies. And this has yielded widespread gaps and inaccuracies in this data that makes it underused for decision making. And in Honduras, 91% of people we surveyed responded that they don't use the government's publicly available aid information due to concerns about sort of trusting government data to be accurate or also sort of being able to use this data, having the capacity to use it in their decision making. And so I think as we're you know, standing at the beginning of the data revolution for the SDGs, we really need to face these barriers to data use head on, because I think the consequences of producing data that lie fallow from this use are way too high to ignore. I think first, you know, we're not going to achieve the SDGs, we're not going to end extreme poverty if important data, if important decisions about the allocation of development resources is made using incomplete or inaccurate data. And second, every dollar that we're investing in data is a dollar that we're not spending providing life-saving bed nets or deworming pills. So I just want to leave with one final thought. I think to really bring international development to the information age is going to require more than fancy satellites and supercomputers, as much as we love talking about those things, but rather it's going to understand an understanding of the people that are supposed to use this data and the policy environments within, da within which data-driven decision-making can thrive. And I think only then will we really be able to fully bring international development into the information age. Um, so just to summarize some of the main points, I think first, it's critical that we connect data producers and data users and create better feedback <coughs> loops between the two so we can make sure that we're actually collecting the right data that people are interested in using and in a format that's accessible for them to use. 
We need to invest in innovative technologies to fill in the data gaps on development progress by investing in sort of smarter and cheaper ways to collect development data. We need to put the data we collect to work in decisions to target development aid investments to make sure we're actually reaching the populations that need those investments the most, and in efforts to evaluate more development programs to create a bigger body of evidence on what works and what doesn't in international development. And finally, we need to invest in solutions to address these significant barriers to data use so we can make data accessible, analyzable, and actionable for all people. So thank you so much. <laughs>